Thanks for watching. Thank you for being here. Give us a thumbs up. Share us out. Or subscribe if you haven't. Welcome aboard. <laughs>
The subconscious is, of course, a fact. The extent of its power is unknown. For example, is it possible that subconscious thought exists and has force even after death? Let us consider that as we eavesdrop on Professor Homer Knowles late one snowy afternoon. Come in, Ted. Come in. Huh. Am I, uh, am I late? Oh, no, no, no. It's nothing important. Good. Ben and I became so absorbed in what he calls the importance of continuity. Uh, ben? Oh, oh. Ben Ware, of course. Yes, one of the best graduate students we've ever had, Homer. Oh, yes. Exceptional. Now, oh, what's this, uh, mundane subject you wanted to discuss? A bequest to the college. Ah, I like that. Who's bestowed what on us? Mrs. Albert Pope? Pope? Don't think I know her. Oh, it's unlikely that you would. She died a few weeks ago and has left whatever art she owned to the college. Don't get your hopes up. She was a poor, simple woman. Oh, a thoughtful gesture all the same, Homer. Unusual. You knew her, of course. Yes, slightly. The college has paid her a pension for years. Her husband was superintendent of our fine arts building for a long time. And you arranged it so her husband's pension would go to her. <laughs> That's like you. Oh, it's the only decent thing to do. Of course. Sure it was. Your irony is transparent, Ted. <laughs> so is your sentimentality. Now, all of us know it, Homer. And we respect you for it. And uh, the bequest? Would you pick it up for us, Ted? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you. Look it over and evaluate it. There won't be many pieces. Photographs, prints, a watercolor or two. Nothing of value, probably. Uh, except to her. I appreciate this, Ted. I'm well, glad to do it. If her things have no value, perhaps we should give them to the thrift shop at the hospital. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, who knows? She may have owned a masterpiece without knowing it. <laughs> well, I doubt that. But you never know. The Pope's lived up here for years. She just might have collected an early local artist. Well, look the stuff over and give me a report. I'm on my way. Is that you, Ted? Hi, darling. Here, give me a hand. Oh, now, what have you dragged home? Uh, the soul of Mrs. Albert Pope. Give it to me in English, Professor. No, I mean it. Here, take this old photo album. All right. Yeah, this big portfolio is heavy. Where did you get all this junk? Homer had me pick it up from Mrs. Pope, uh, the late Mrs. Pope. She gave all this stuff to the college. I gave it a quick glance. Find anything? You know my dream. Uh -huh, it won't come true this time, Diane. No, nope, there's no treasure here. But there is one thing that's interesting. Here, let me hang up my coat and I'll show you. But Ben's expected any minute. It's almost seven. Oh, it is? Oh, I didn't realize it was so late. Oh, this, was, this will only take a second, I. Now, come on. I want you to see this and take a look. <sighs> hey. Oh, it's really quite lovely. Yeah, it's pretty good engraving. All the other stuff has no real value. Reproductions, mostly Van Gogh. Two of the sunflowers are Renoir. She had good day. Yeah, and a lot of photographs. Ben might like them. He collects pictures of old New Hampshire houses. Then he ought to have this engraving. Hey, that's an idea. Well, what do you think of it? I like it. Hmm. That's a fine Victorian house and grounds. Well, whose house is it? Do you know? No, no idea. Yeah, it is a pretty good engraving. Clean lines, flagstone path leading up to a wide front porch, three floors. Nicely framed by firs. Look, the house plantings are very well done. But? Uh, no, no, you know as well as I do, Di. It really needs a figure in the foreground to give the picture a focal point. As it is, it's, well, it's just an engraving of a house. A beautiful house. Yeah, but the engraving is only architectural, like a plan. Has no meaning. It's just a, just a house. Who's the artist? I don't know. It's unsigned. Yeah. With a figure in the foreground, the engraving would come alive. Well, Ben will still like it. Well, there's no reason he shouldn't have it. Or some of the old photographs. <laughs> He's a bug on the past. What he doesn't want, I'll take over to the hospital thrift shop. They can sell them. It must be Ben. I'll wash up and be right back, Di. You play host. Hi. Hey, come in, come in. Wow, you look pretty, Diane. Ah, oh, flattery earns you a cocktail. And thank you. Where did you get your manners? Most art students are reclusive. Well, I'm absorbed by art, but I can also see beauty around me. Oh, you're too much. Ted will be right out. He came home just a few minutes ago. Hey, look. Oh, what's all that? The aesthetic side of the late Mrs. Pope. Look it over and take what you want. Uh, I have to uh, check on dinner. Oh, here's Ted. 
Hello, Ben. What can I fix for you? The usual? Yeah, please. Well, why don't you sit down in front of the fire? Uh, who is Mrs. Pope? I'll tell you all about her in a minute. Huh. Not that I know much more than you do. Ah, here you are. White and as cold as a ski lift. Half an hour and we eat. Ah, here you are, darling. Mm, thank you. Uh, a toast. Right on. Uh, here's to us. Who's like us? Damn few. I'd love it. Where did you pick that up, Ben? <laughs> You know, when I was in college in Chicago years ago. Oh, yeah. I keep forgetting that, uh, that you're from the Midwest. Why did you abandon Chicago with its arts institute and the universities with their, well, excellent fine arts departments and come to this little cottage? I love New Hampshire. And then there's Professor Knowles and Ted. They know everything. Uh, hardly, Pat. No, more than I'll ever know. You really like the climate? Yeah, I really do. Real winter. Unspoiled forests, uh, clean air, remoteness, the snow... All of it keeps your perspective straight. Maybe yours. Mine freezes up. Give him the pictures, Ted. Ah, yes. The Mrs. Albert Pope collection. Uh, she left that meager pile to the college, and, uh, well, there's one picture you might admire. No, 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 no. Stay where you are. Uh, it's quite a good engraving of some old mansion. You collect pictures of old homes, don't you, Ben? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I like them. Uh, they give me a sense of, uh, uh continuity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and stability. Yeah, here we are. Oh, wow, it's beautiful. That's a beautiful house. Yep, that's a pretty good engraving. All it lacks is a figure in the foreground to give it a focal point. Oh, well, there is a figure in the foreground. No, <laughs> wrong. Oh, well, there is, really. Take a look. Oh, but both Diane and I... Well, let me see. There. You see? Next to the path. The figure of a man on his hands and knees crawling towards the house. But I, I, I swear... I'd swear, too... When you showed me the engraving, Ted, there was no figure. Well, maybe, maybe you just glanced at it. No, no. We looked at it under the light. There was nothing in the foreground. <laughs> well, there is now. A man furtively crawling across the lawn toward the porch. Ted? Hmm? Yeah, yes, darling? Are you going to stay up? It's late. <sighs> Come on, come on, sit down. Sit down for a minute, Di. Oh, it's cold in here. Oh, I'll toss another log on the fire. Not for me. I'm ready for the down comfort. Yeah, so am I, but... I just can't get that engraving out of my mind. We made a mistake, that's all. There's no question there's a figure in the foreground. But there, there wasn't. Well, I didn't think so either. But there is. Oh, well, I studied the thing. The foreground was empty. So what? So it's mystifying. I don't like that. <laughs> Can't you admit we made a mistake? Yeah, I made lots of mistakes, but this wasn't one of them. I saw what I saw. Now, let's, let's take another look at it. Ben looked at it as if we were a, a little mental. Yeah, well, I don't blame him. Now, come over. Come over by me, Di. An eye check, right? Right. It's gone. Come on. The figure of the man crawling toward the house. It's gone. Now, you tell me. It wasn't there when we first looked at the engraving, and then it was there when you showed it to Ben Ware, and now nothing. Well, you agree I haven't gone mental. Well, if you have, so have I. How in the world do you explain it, Ted? Oh, I can't. Is there some kind of drawing technique? No, that... no, no, Di. It's plain, straightforward engraving. Uh, Homer might know. Well, call him up and let's take the picture over to him. Oh, it's pretty late. Only 10.30. You want to sit here and brood over the thing until you freeze to death? Oh, I, I, I feel ridiculous. I'll call him. He's only half a block away and he stays up late. I don't know. This simply makes no sense. Ted, you expect me to believe that the engraving had no figure in the foreground... And that then one appeared, and that now it's gone again? Well, see for yourself, Homer. Well, that won't do much good. <laughs> I never saw the figure. Oh, this is just foolish, Ted. Well, here, take a look at the thing. Well, it's quite good. Not valuable, but well etched. The prize among the collection of Mrs. Polk? Yeah, well, the rest is nothing. It's prints and a lot of photographs. Mm hmm. The house looks familiar to me. Well, that's the clue. I mean, if we knew the history of the house, we might be able to explain this phenomenon. Oh, phenomenon, my foot. But honestly, Homer, the three of us saw what we saw. Hmm. Ah, oh, let me see. I wonder if that could be the home of that young judge, long since dead, uh, who... Uh... Now, what happened to him? 
Oh, yes, yes. Now, I remember. He shot and killed a man for trespassing. Good heavens. Well, why the devil would Mrs. Pope have the engraving? Now, who was the judge? Well, I just can't remember. It was years ago. Maybe as many as 25. Did you say he killed a man? Well, can you remember who? I'm, it might have made news. Oh, not as much as you might think, Ted. It was an occurrence. Murder is an occurrence? Well, up here, a man's property is inviolate, Stan. Homer, who was killed? Oh, my goodness. I remember now. It was Albert Pope. Aha. Uh -huh. The fine arts building. Yes, that's under. right. A man with a bad habit. When he went hunting, he wanted everywhere. He trespassed. The judge... Uh, I wish I could remember his name. Well, he warned Albert once, and the next time fined him and jailed him for a week. And the third time, the judge shot and killed him. Yes, that's right. Incredible. And the judge lived happily ever after. I don't know. Well, that's some story, Homer. It's pretty grim, but uh, it has nothing to do with your disappearing figure. All the same, I'd like to know the whole story. Huh. You've aroused my curiosity. Let me check into it. I'd appreciate it, Homer. <laughs> you may smile at what we told you, but unless Di and Ben and I are deluded, that engraving has the power to change itself. I mean, it's, it's weird. The only explanation is... <laughs> Supernatural. As eminent a philosopher as Santayana wrote, there is nothing impossible in the existence of the supernatural. Its existence seems to me decidedly probable. Is that what we have encountered here? It seems impossible for a picture to change its composition. And yet, three educated, rational persons maintain that the etching did change. Where this will lead us, I have no idea. But I will return shortly with Act Two. Spring is springing up all across the land. And the flowers are blooming. Avon's sunny smiles come shining. It's a time for beauty. And Avon's smiles. Avon representative, any old worn-out lipstick, you'll get a new full-size Avon lipstick for just 35 cents. It's a 225 value. We're out to put Avon on everybody's lips. You can feel it with smiles so far and so many shades so fresh, so young and you give me spring and style. Oh, Avon, you make me smile. Limited time offer. Your Avon representative has details. Ahoy, seafood lovers. Contemplate a large pot filled with steamed whole crabs, prawns, clams, and mussels in hot broth. This taste tempter is especially at Squeaky Speakies, 9225 Gulf Road, Des Plaines. Hi, I'm Gourmet on the Go, Edward Robert Brooks, suggesting you visit Squeaky's unique fun restaurant for lunch or dinner. Seated in antique-filled recreations of old-time shops, you'll enjoy delicious fin fish like fresh scrod, filet of sole and beer batter, or charcoal fresh salmon. Shellfish choices include steamed Alaskan king crab legs and stuffed whole Maine lobster. Create your own salad from a cart wheeled table side. That's Squeaky Speakies, 9225 Golf Road, Des Plaines. Phone 298-3510. 298-3510. Now appearing in the Speakeasy Lounge, Phase 4, a contemporary music group for your dancing and listening pleasure. Hear Phase 4, Tuesday through Saturday, 8.30 until closing at Squeaky Speakies, 9225 Golf Road, Des Plaines. We've gotten ourselves into a byway in the strange world of the macabre, and it has led us to a small college town in New Hampshire and to an etching of an old mansion that seems to have the power to change its composition. There's no rational explanation for it. Is there an irrational one? The subject puzzles and disturbs Ted Morris, an assistant professor of fine arts. Perhaps the history of the house will reveal a secret, a clue. 
But even as he thinks it, he smiles in disbelief. Oh, boy, I know so so far. Since when have you begun talking to yourself? Ben? Oh, yes. Good morning, Ben. <laughs> My mother says persons who talk to themselves are crazy. Well, she's absolutely correct. I have gone over the edge. I see. That's why you sit there behind your desk grading papers mm -hmm. and mumbling to yourself? I mean, is that what I'm doing? Yeah, that's what you were doing. What is it? Uh, ben, uh, there is no figure of a man crawling across the lawn up to the house. <laughs> but we saw it. No, it wasn't there when I first looked at the engraving. Then you picked it up, and there it was. And last night, I looked again. The figure was gone. That's crazy. Oh, we are. I showed it to Homer Knowles. He smiled, but, uh, well, he's going to indulge me. He's going to track down the history of the mansion. Oh, good. Yeah, I'd like to know the story. Yeah, any idea where the mansion is located? No, no, no. But Homer did recall that it belonged to some judge, a despotic kind of guy. Uh. Now, it seems this Albert Pope was, uh, was an inveterate trespasser. Well, finally, the judge blasted him. End of Albert. End of our building superintendent. No charge brought against the judge. Wow. Jungle justice. Yeah. That's some story. Well, there may be more to it. Homer's trying to find out. When he does... You're welcome to it, and to the etching. I know you like photographs and paintings of old houses. Well, there's more to it than that, Ted. I don't know, for some odd reason, I'm... I'm... Well, I'm sort of drawn to it. Homer, what a pleasant surprise. I haven't dropped in at a bad time, have I, Diane? Uh, come in, Homer. I'm just starting a fire. Hmm, let me take your coat. Thank you. My dear. And the package? Uh, no, no, no. I want to show you something. It said Don Engraving. Uh, had any luck uh, about the history of the house? I'll come to that. But, uh, take a look at the thing. <gasps> I can't believe it. Well, well, well. So I'm not crazy. When you showed me the picture last night, there was no figure in it. Now, look then. Yes. A figure crouching on the porch. Very sinister. A creeping man... He vanished, and now he appears again, this time on the porch. You know, we are seeing something being acted out. I refuse to believe it. Now, this is nonsense. It's a very old engraving. Changes in the atmosphere may account for these uh, subtle changes. I can't explain it, but <laughs> that must be it. And our imagination. No, 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 that won't do. We are not imagining what we can see. I want to know about that house, the judge, and that creeping figure. Now, what have you learned, Homer? The mansion belonged to a judge, Asa Lawrence, a young firebrand. Came to the bench in his 40s. Where? Earned his degree in Boston, went into practice in Orton, and uh, became a judge in 1950. He had a rather heavy hand, really enforced the law. And shot and killed Albert Pope. Oh, no question about that. Oh, he must have been mad. No, he wasn't. The amateur deer hunters from Boston and New York still swarm all over the area during the seasons, and they shoot at anything that moves, sometimes at each other. And they can't read. The no trespassing signs mean nothing to them. They've got their guns, and by George, they're going to shoot something. Yes, they're a menace. Well, Judge Lawrence find them dizzy. But he murdered Albert Polk. Oh, he warned him time and time again. Find and jailed him. But Albert did what he pleased. And his wife became a widow. Anything else, Homer? Well, what about the judge's mansion? It burned to the ground. The judge died from smoke inhalation. When, recently? No, no, no. It's about three years after he killed Pope. And when did all this take place? Uh, roughly. I'd say about uh, 1954. Hmm, so that's the story. Now, there's more to it than that, Homer. I would like to reconstruct the whole tragedy from Pope's death to the fire in the mansion. Well, for goodness sake, why? Because there is something significant we don't know. I think so, too. Something's been unfolding before our eyes. You know what I think? Go on, Doc. I think we've been watching the man who set fire to the judge's house. Oh, my dear Diane. No, 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 it's an idea. <laughs> You're hallucinating both of well, you. What about the fire, Homer? Can we find out? Well, I would imagine so. Someone in Orton may remember it. What about the newspapers? I don't think the Boston papers... Well, no, 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 that's an idea. They might have carried a line or two about the judge's death. Let me check further. I'll leave the engraving with you. Ted! Oh. Oh, my. I simply will not believe it. Yes. The figure on the porch has disappeared. But look there. 
Do you see it? One of the front room windows is now open. Ted, dear, may I suggest we pack our bags and make our getaway from this forsaken spot? Oh, it's got you, has it? It's driving me up the wall. That engraving is... Well, it's evil. Oh, forget about it, darling. How can I? How can you? We have to explain what's happened to it, Ted, or the whole thing will nag at us until we... until we see ghosts in every corner. Do you believe in the supernatural? No, no, of course not. I... Well, I don't think I do. Who can explain everything? <laughs> it's beyond me. It means something. Something bad. I don't think you ought to give it to Ben. It it might do him some harm. Oh, nonsense. He's he's drawn to it. He said that? Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll get it there. Ben's drawn to the engraving. How odd. Is this the home of the magic picture? Oh, come in, Ben. Uh, go, go easy on the magic picture talk, huh? Diane is uh, terribly upset. Oh. Um, make yourself at home in the Institute for the Befuddled. Oh, anything new happen? Yeah, two things. Homer brought the engraving back, and there, as plain as day, was a figure crouching on the porch. Then the figure disappeared, and there was an open window in the living room of the house. Now, this is really crazy, isn't it? Oh, uh, the engraving is yours, Ben. Homer said to give it to you. Oh, well, thank you. And I'll thank him. You don't want it, Ben. I think it's evil. It has turned back time to some previous awful event. Well, that's a little hard for me to follow. Well... <sighs> Radio sound, all, all those uh, trillions of airwaves out there, right here in this room. Now, look, I once read or heard that maybe someday science could capture some of those never-ending sounds. They, they go like ripples when a pebble is tossed into a pond. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Science fiction. Maybe not. Wouldn't you like to hear uh, well, uh, Caesar speaking in the form or, or Cleopatra Disraeli and, and any other great man or woman? Yes, but airwaves are a fact. I mean, what's that got to do with the changing engraving? Well, could it be possible that here's the engraving of the house and it's lovely and all that, and then something comes along to defile it and it, it, it's somehow recorded? Well, that assumes that the house is a living thing. Well, isn't it? A house has its own character. Now, this is too far-fetched for me, Diane. Look, do you believe in the supernatural? I've, I've already asked Ted. Well, yes. I can't define what I mean by it. But insights come to me that I can't explain. Like, well, coming up here for graduate study, something compelled me to. There was some kind of uh, intervention in me that, that led me here. Well, that's all I'm saying, Ben. That's it. There must have been some kind of intervention with the house, and it's recreating what it was. It has a mystery to reveal, or a, a tragedy to show us. I, I swear it. So, so it's like a soap opera. Huh? Tune in tomorrow to find out what happens next. Yeah, except that they never end, do they? <laughs> this will end. We watch the picture. You watch it, Ben, if you really want to take it home. Until the engraving has retold its story. May I see the engraving? Sure, it's over there on the table. Oh. That entire bequest for Mrs. Pope may have been worthless, but... Now, well, this engraving of hers. Now what? Well, the die must be right. The engraving's changed again. What? The figure has emerged from the house and is halfway down the path. He's got a bundle in his arms. No, look more closely, both of you. That is no bundle. The man is carrying... A small child. Yes. Yes, who is it? Ben Ware, Professor. I uh, noticed your light. And I... Oh, it's probably all right, Ben. I'm <laughs> pleased to see you. It's pleasant when students drop in. Makes me think I'm still part of the living scene. Oh, you're more than that, Professor. You're a living legend. Oh, dear, I hope not. <laughs> Come, sit down. Ah, you have the engraving. Yes, uh, Ted said I could have it. Yes, of course. Perplexing, isn't it? There's been another change in the engraving. There's a man leaving the house and carrying a small child in his arms. The devil, you say? Now, what in the world can that mean? Well, we don't know, but Ted said you were going to check the newspapers. Uh... Yes, so I am. A former student of ours is assistant editor of Boston newspaper. He'll check his morgue in the morning, but... Uh... Oddly enough, he remembered something about Judge Lawrence. 
the house in the engraving burned down. Do you know that? Yes, sir. Um, I'm more interested in what happened earlier, at the time that Albert Pope was murdered. Well, I do know a little about that, Ben. After Albert was shot and killed, his brother Steve arrived with murder in his eyes. Even before the funeral, the brother was threatening to kill Judge Lawrence. But he didn't, huh? No. The judge died in the fire, and that was three years later. Did the brother try to get even with the judge? I don't know. Hmm. Well, that's what I'm interested in, Professor. Well, why is that, my boy? Uh, because of the figure in the picture. Uh, was it the judge who was running away with a child of his own? You think the child was abducted? Well, from the changes we've seen in the picture, a man sneaked into the house and came out carrying a child. I see. Not likely to be the judge. Did Judge Lawrence preside here? Uh, no, in Orton, a few miles away. Maybe I'll drive over there and ask some questions. Someone's sure to remember the fire, but I don't think you'll learn much about the murder. Albert Pope lived here. Yeah, but I might learn something about the judge. You know, how old he was when he died? Was he married? Did he have children? What's become of the survivors? And the story doesn't end with that man sneaking out of the house. Oh, perhaps not. Uh, if I learn anything from Boston, I'll tell Ted. Yeah, I'll do the same if I learn anything in Orton. I suggest that you begin in the general store. It's the gossip center. <laughs> Enjoy your engraving. Mm, I'm going to photograph it tonight. You are? Well, for heaven's sake, why? Well, the old mansion burned down, remember? Are you suggesting... No, I like the etching. I just want to be sure I have a record of it. Just in case it disappears. No matter what the outcome may be of the engraving that unexplainably altered itself, first to show a foreground figure, then an open window, and then the figure leaving the old mansion with a child in his arms. We're at a loss to rationalize this phenomenon. History may supply the answer. After Professor Knowles talks with that Boston newspaper editor, we may know more. I'll return with Act Three shortly. Maybe you've got a neighbor who just bought a new Electra, and he's gotten so smug and self-satisfied lately, you can't stand it. Well, look at it this way. If you had just gotten a car with all the luxury and prestige of Electra, and a trim European-like design that makes it easier than you might imagine to park and maneuver in city traffic, wouldn't you be a little insufferable for a while? We thought so. The new Electra, at your Buick dealers now. A little dying, a little magic, a little dying, a little... What's really so bad about hay fever? You kidding? I can't breathe, I can't work, rest, I'm all red-eyed, nitchy. Then take contact. The cold medicine? Right. Contact? Contact. The 600 tiny time pills in one capsule help block pollen's attack up to 12 hours. All day? All day, while you work. All night while you rest. I didn't know. Contact contains the hay fever relief ingredient doctors prescribe most. Allergies contacts business, too. Take when needed, only as directed. Got a great vacation idea for you. Delta Airlines is serving up Florida on a silver platter. Really? I'll have a slice of Miami, a bit of Tampa St. Pete, and a helping of Orlando Walt Disney World. I'm not kidding. On Delta Super Saver Fares, you can fly a Delta night coach to Florida for up to 50% off the regular round-trip day tourist fare. Now, you know I can't resist a half-price sale. You save 50% Monday through Thursday, 40% on weekends. Oh, put me down for Wednesday, but not until you read me all that fine print. No big strings at all. Just make Make your reservation and buy your tickets seven days ahead of time. You can make your stay as short as two days or up to 45 days. Well, with what I save on airfare, I could stay. You know, Super Saver seats are limited. Better call Delta or your travel agent now. Just hand me the nearest phone. Fly a Delta night coach to Miami or Fort Lauderdale for as little as $124 round trip. To Tampa, St. Pete, $109 round trip. To West Palm Beach, $120 round trip. Delta is ready when you are. This is WBBM Chicago. You've heard of the poltergeist. That word is German for noise and ghost. Many will attest to visits by these noisy phantoms. They're noisy, all right. Rapping here and moving objects there, they exist. 
No question about it. Well, if they can manifest themselves as supernatural visitors, why can't we accept what we have already heard? An old engraving of a house alters itself, and what the beholder sees begins to piece together a tragic story of long ago. So far, we know of a murder, a death in a fire, and we have had a hint of an abduction. It is late the next day at Ted Morris's house. Ben may stop by, Homer, if he returns early enough from Orton. You know, he was correct about one part of the story, Ted. Ben suspected that the figure carrying the small child from the house was a kidnapper. I knew it. I spoke to a friend of mine in Boston late this morning. The back issues covered the story. And briefly, it's an ugly story. Someone kidnapped the judge's child? Uh, no, uh, Diane, uh, l- let's, let's take it step by step. Huh? Albert Pope was murdered. His brother Steve came up here from Chicago for the funeral. He was outraged at Judge Lawrence. And a week later, the judge's small boy, about three years old, was abducted. The brother did it. Well, that's what everyone assumed, but there was no proof. Steve Pope was arrested in Chicago, but he was freed for lack of evidence. But there is more to it than that, Ted. Whoever kidnapped the child committed murder. (gasps) No! The governess was stabbed to death. Good Lord. I wondered how a man could break into the house and walk away with a small boy without being detected. And and the judge's wife? That's another part of this tragic story. She had died in childbirth. Perhaps that explains in part why Judge Lawrence was such a harsh man. He married late, and by the time he was 40, he'd lost his wife, and then his little boy was abducted. What a tragic story. Yes, I'm rather sorry I unearthed it. And they never found a trace of the child? None. The search went on for months. The laws, Judge Lawrence's two losses, seemed to break his spirit. How is it possible for... No, I suppose it is possible. I I was about to ask how a child can just vanish. Well, in a big city, it's not all that difficult. The child is abandoned at an orphanage or at a home. But they'd report it, Ted. Well, they should, but just read the papers. There's always a story of an abandoned child... Well, there's the whole story. Yeah, and the etching recreated the facts. Yes, the essential one. The story without an ending. Has this Steve Pope ever been back here? Or or did you ever speak to Albert's widow about all this? No, but uh, I have been wondering how Mrs. Pope came to acquire the engraving. My guess is that uh, she simply bought it. Yeah, but why would Mrs. Pope want a picture of the home of a man who killed her husband? She may have wanted it... As a reminder of her husband's murder. Yes, as a talisman. Albert was a happy-go-lucky fellow. His wife uh, was somewhat hard. Yeah, with a grim sense of humor. Homer, one more question. Can we find a picture of Judge Lawrence? A photograph? Even one of him in his robe? Oh, I should think so. Would you ask your Boston friend to mail us one? I should think there'd be an official picture of the judge in the Orton courthouse. Of course. Why'd you want it, Di? I'd rather not say. You might laugh. Let me say only that, um, uh, I've got a hunch. I really must thank Professor Knowles. He's gone to a lot of trouble about the story behind the engraving. Well, it's been diverting, Ben. Not that anyone will believe it. Though some old codgers in Orton confirm it, Ted. The story, I mean. I meant the engraving that kept on changing its composition. Oh, no. No, no. There's no explanation for that. Something activated it. Yeah, and still is, Diane. The thing's changed again. Now what? Last night, I shot a photograph of the etching. I had a hunch that something might happen. It did. I brought it along to show you. It's... Oh, the etching is scorched. Yep. That's from the fire that burned down the house. So, the cycle is completed. And there's an end to it. And somewhere, somewhere out there is a small boy, perhaps dead and forgotten, or an alive, grown man. Oh, I'd certainly like to talk to Steve Pope. Well, I wouldn't. I've had enough of the engraving. Now, look, all this took place 25 years ago. Please, let's drop it. You drop it. You and Ben and Homer, you have no imagination. I'm going to do some research on my own. Your research, darling, is based on hunch. And hunch is intuition. What's your hunch, Diane? It's so far-fetched that even if it's correct, I don't think I'll tell. It'll come to you across a crowded room. Hey, that's...
That's it. What's what? That line from South Pacific in the song, of course. What are you talking about, Diane? How does one fall in love? I don't remember. Come on, don't be funny. I'm serious. Isn't there some magical attraction that strikes two persons at the same time? You know in a glance that, that you're meant for each other? That's corny, but you know you know that you're intertwined in every way. Yeah, but what the devil has falling in love got to do with the engraving? You don't see it, Ben? Nope. Well, I do. I know the answer, and I'm going to prove it. Now, Diane, why won't you tell me? Because if I'm wrong, I'd look like a fool, and I don't want to cause embarrassment. Would you give me a hint? I'd, I'd rather not, Ted. You'll just have to wait until tomorrow. Well, have you some wild theory about Steve Pope? No, that's not it. If the police couldn't convict him, I sure can't. Oh, he did it all right. I suppose the police could check all the orphanages and adoption homes in Chicago, but well, they probably did that already. And who knows if the, if the little boy was dropped in Chicago. I don't know. That's a good point. Well, of course, he, he wouldn't have been dropped in a small city. A person can be anonymous only in a big one. I still think Chicago. Uh, more intuition. Huh? Oh, you make fun of it, Ted. But you've had hunches, haven't you? Yes, yes. I must admit that I have. But I can't imagine what you have in mind. Well, now, what's this that you have to do tomorrow? Huh? I'm going to the courthouse. Oh, yes, yes. To try to find a picture of Judge Lawrence? What else? I may make a long-distance telephone call. Oh, you've lost me. There's something I have to find out, but I don't quite know how to go about it. I I don't want to come right out and ask a blunt question. Oh, since when? You won't give me an inkling of what you're up to? All right. Just an inkling. Shoot. Think about the engraving. Mm-hmm. Go on. You brought it home from Mrs. Pope's. Mm -hmm. You said it lacked a figure in the foreground to give it a focal point. That's right, I did. When did the figure appear? Uh, the second time we looked at it. Think about what you just said, my dear Ted, and you'll have the clue. Come in. Oh, what a grisly day. Oh, I love it. <laughs> you have to be crazy, but thanks for coming to my rescue. Drop your coat and come in. I have hot coffee. Great. Ted had to take the car. I know. He's giving a lecture in Putney. I'll be glad to drive you to Orton. Oh, that's very kind of you, Ben. Do sit down. Mm. This will warm you up. Oh, thank you. Are the roads passable? Yeah, sure. And Orton's not far away. Nice little town. I had a good visit there. Did I tell you I saw the judge's former estate? No. The house is gone, I suppose. It leveled years ago, and the rubble's been hauled away. The land's been developed. Who owns it now? Do you know? Some real estate company, uh, Country Homes. Well, they've sold off a number of three-acre estates. The judge owned about 50 acres. Must have been something back in the 50s. Beautiful property facing the river. Judge, landowner, artist. Hmm. Quite a man. And he was only 40 when he died. When you receive your Master of Fine Arts, what then, Ben? Back to Chicago? Oh, no. No, New Hampshire is in my blood. I hope to teach here at the college or at one of the nearby prep schools. And your parents? Wouldn't they like to have you closer by? Well, they've never understood me. Oh, no. Not another one of those. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Of course not. No, they're wonderful. Uh, I mean, they wanted me to take a good job in something in Chicago. You know, get married, have children, visit every week. <laughs> you know... The conventional. And the long you come and you like art with a capital A. Yeah, right. They shook their heads, but they never stood in my way. They're great. You'll meet them at commencement. They know all about you and Ted. How do you explain your interest in fine arts? Have you ever tried? No, I can't. I mean, there's nothing in their background to suggest an interest of that kind. Oh? My dad's a shipping clerk in a big book company. Mom's just a housewife. Any uh, brothers and sisters? No, they never could have any children of their own. After you, you mean? No. What I said. Then? I was adopted. Oh, wow, what a drive. How did the lecture go? Beautifully. Uh, did uh, Ben drive you over to Orton? Yeah. You uh, found what you wanted? Yeah. Hey, would you knock off the country dialect and tell all? Wait a second. You have been devious, haven't you? Yep. Uh, would you would you please stop that? 
<laughs> now, you insisted that I drive our car because... And don't say yep, or I'll slug you. You wanted to be with Ben. Yep. Oh, Ted, you're marvelous. Yes, and you're replaceable. Do you know that? <laughs> now, now, stop being coy. Did you find a picture of Judge Lawrence? I found more than that. My intuition was correct. Well, tell all. Not so fast. Telephone Homer and insist he come right over this minute. I want both of you to hear what I have to say. And then, and I'm not joking, Ted, we have a vital decision to make. So that's the tragic Judge Jason Lawrence. Handsome man. Is that all you see, Homer? Ted? Should we see something more? Study the photograph. Make allowance for the old-fashioned hairstyle. Now, doesn't he remind you of someone? Oh, my. It's the image of Ben Ware. Why, so it is. What an astonishing coincidence. Oh, coincidence. Why do you think Ben was, well, as he said, drawn to the engraving? Why does he... A young man from Chicago, love New Hampshire, and, Ted, it was when Ben picked up the engraving that it began to change. That's astonishing. And wait until you hear this. Ben was adopted. Judge Asa Lawrence was Ben's father, and Ben was the little boy kidnapped soon after Albert Pope's death, taken to Chicago, abandoned, and adopted by Ben's foster parents, the Wares. Incredible. But true. So, now, gentlemen, what do we do? Hmm. I don't know. Homer? Conceal your discovery, Diane. Ben's a happy young man, and where is a good name? If we tell him what we know, his life would be violently disrupted. The publicity would be unnerving. We'd cause trouble for Ben's foster parents and gain what? Nothing. But but he'd inherit... Oh, after almost 25 years, Ted, I doubt if there's anything to inherit. That's my advice. I agree with it, Helmer. Yep, so do I. I hope the judge would understand. So, once again, we complete an odd tale with an ending you may wish to challenge. It is a hackneyed proverb that states that the violent by violence fall. But hackneyed or not, it's true. Frontier justice draws retribution. That is the tragic moral to be drawn from what we have heard. I'll return shortly. I'm Betsy Palmer speaking for CHEER, C-H-E-A-R, Children's Hearing Education and Research. Loss of hearing is silent, painless, and invisible. About 20 million Americans, that's one in ten, are affected. It's America's largest but least recognized ailment. Loss of hearing attracts fewer than 1% of the dollars spent on medical research, and more is urgently needed. Deafness makes learning of language especially difficult for infants and restricts communication for those who have the problem. Founded in 1969, Cheer wants to do more. No one is immune to hearing loss. Many people can't hear what I'm saying now. I'm glad that you can. Won't you help Cheer? For information or contributions, please write Cheer, C-H-E-A-R, P.O. Box 362, Yonkers, New York, 10704. That's C-H-E-A-R, P.O. Box 362, Yonkers, New York, 10704. strange scheme of things, each of us is an unsolvable mystery. Who are you, really? Even if you can trace your roots back a thousand years, what preceded them? We are the creatures, both of heredity and of environment, and what stirs in our subconscious cannot be exactly explained. Judge Lawrence shot and killed a man. His young son was kidnapped. The judge died in a fire. Why? Can anyone really explain that sequence of events? 
Our cast included Paul Hecht, Patricia Elliott, Tony Roberts, and Ralph Bell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. This is Mission Control. Hello, traveler. And uh, that was it, Jack. Tom, could Traveler have burned up on re-entry? Well, it could, I suppose, if the angle of re-entry was too sharp. But the big question is, these were experienced men, our best. Now, how could they make such a mistake? And in the Pacific, nothing's been sighted or recovered. Oh, we've had ten ships out there. Oh, I should say the Navy's had. Covering as much of the area they were heading for as possible. And they picked up nothing? Well... One thing, of course, it's got nothing to do with traveler. It fished something out of the Pacific. <laughs> a teddy bear. What? Yep, there it was, floating. A teddy bear? Yes, sir. <laughs> what do you make of that? Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour allergy capsule, and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. of mystery, and it's mystery we have in store for you today, in a house nestled in the pleasant English countryside. The house we are to visit is not a brooding castle, nor is it set on one of those windy and cheerless moors that Britain is so famous for. It's a modest two-story cottage, high on a rise that overlooks the tiny hamlet of Salford below. The residents of the town give it a wide berth even though no one has lived in it for more than two years. And two young men who rented it discovered why. What the devil is that noise, Mark? Well, it sounds as though it's coming from up there. Look! I see it, but I don't believe it. A rat! It's as big as a tabby cat. Look at the eyes, Brian. Look at the eyes. <laughs> mystery drama, The Judge's House, is based on a story by Bram Stoker and was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by Bob Joram. It stars Gordon Gould and Lloyd Batista. I'll return shortly with Act One.
Saturday on CBS Television. It's a double feature. First on the premiere of Walt Disney. Meet Herbie, the car with a mind of its own. How did that little car get here? Dean Jones and Michelle Lee in Herbie the Love Bug, the most popular comedy in Disney history. Then, make way for Matilda. Elliot Gould and Robert Mitchum have their hands full with a boxing kangaroo and won't stop till she's heavyweight champion of the world. Disney's Herbie the Love Bug, followed by Matilda. Saturday at 8, 7 Central and Mountain on CBS Television. Taking a laxative? Yeah, traveling throws my system off. But so can a laxative. Not Metamucil. That's Metamucil? Metamucil Instant Mix in little packets. Mm. Easy to take along. And easy on your system. Because Metamucil is made from natural fiber with no chemical stimulants, more doctors recommend Metamucil for really gentle relief. Mmm, I like that orange flavor. Mm -hmm, me too. Easy to take. If not nature, Metamucil. Read label and follow directions. Spectacular days here at Polk Brothers Gigantic Warehouse, 8300 West North Avenue in Melrose Park. It's Polk Warehouse sale time. Slashed prices on everything from a genuine Weber Smoky Joe barbecue grill at 1988 to a Zenith 25-inch color console TV 538. Hundreds of folks are here at Polk's buying gifts for Christmas, for weddings, birthdays at Polk inflation busting prices. Quasar VHS videotape cassettes, $11, limit three. A Sunbeam 18 inch electric mower. The Polk take with price, $99.88. Your choice of an Englander Sealy or Simmons twin size mattress or foundation, $68. Famous Polk trade in allowances save you even more. So bring the family any evening, including Saturday until 10, all day Sunday till 6 and cash in on Super Polk Warehouse Sale Buys. A Whirlpool 6 cubic foot chest type freezer, 269. A General Electric built-in dishwasher, 268. And remember, Polk Brothers still gives you free delivery. Picturesque English country houses have been immortalized in paintings and photographs particularly in travel posters, luring visitors to jolly old England. Often, though, a house that looks so quaint from the outside can harbor strange vibrations inside, particularly when they take on the characteristics of the owner. Such was the judge's house. But we'll arrive there shortly. Let Mark Mason, a young American in England, tell us what happened. <laughs> and wonder how things might have turned out if I hadn't gone to England that spring of 69. I wouldn't have these nightmares that have haunted me over the years. I went to England at the invitation of Brian Stokes, a fellow I'd met when we were both doing graduate work at Stanford University in California. We planned to write a monograph together on abnormal psychology. And he suggested I join him in England for the two months we thought it would take to write it. We were both filled with excitement the day I arrived at this tiny flat in Liverpool. Mark! It's great to see you again. What a time you have. Oh, I can't wait to see the Liverpool sights. Oh, we won't be working here, Mark. Too many distractions. I've entered the cottage at Telford. Complete privacy, as the agent said. Hasn't been lived in for two years. But he said he'd clean it up a bit. Got it for a song. You look disappointed. Where is this Salford? About a hundred kilometers east of the city. Lovely village. Quiet and remote. Just what we need to work. <laughs> when do we start? We'll motor up Saturday. So that leaves us two days here to make a tourist out of you. Freshen up and we'll take in some of the nightlife you've always been chasing after. There'll be precious little in Salford, I'm afraid. place, don't you think? Oh, it's like every picture of an English cottage I've ever seen. <laughs> All it needs is the hollyhocks. I'm a bit early for those yet. I'm dying to see inside. You mean you haven't seen inside? The front was enough to convince me. Besides, the agent assured me it was just what we'd want. Hello. I think that's him coming out the front door. Hello. Nice to see you, ladies. All right. Come on, Mark. Let's go in. You made good time from Liverpool. Didn't expect you to last before. Roads were good. This is my friend from the USA, Mark Mason. Mr. Sheffield. How do you do? <laughs> nice to meet you. Place is all tight and tidy. 
I had a woman in straightening up the past few days, and I lit a fire for you. Makes things a bit cheery. Very thoughtful. What is that on the roof? A bell tower? Oh, yes. Yes, the bell's still there, as a matter of fact. Here we go now. The furniture is a bit stodgy, but serviceable. Oh, that's some fireplace. Oh, it must be eight feet across. Uh, nine, to be exact. I had a good supply of wood put round back. You will need it. It couldn't be better. Oh, and look. This must be the bell rope. That's what it is. It's attached through that hole in the ceiling and up to the tower. Well, let's give it a tug. Oh, no, no, no. Something the matter? It, uh, might startle the village. Oh, is that bad? A very bit superstitious, you know. The villagers are afraid of this house. At one time, it belonged to a Judge Harrison Schelling. Oh, there he is, in that portrait over the fireplace. Oh, I love him. Schelling. Schelling. No. Was he famous? Uh, infamous is the word. Oh? He was known as the hanging judge. He sent more people to the gallows than any other ten judges put together. Oh, nice guy. He was really hated and feared. The reason I asked you not to ring the bell was because the judge, so the story goes, would ring it on the day of every hanging he ordered. Ugh. He must have been a fiend to take such delight in such a macabre custom. Well, he's not still around, is he? Oh, no, no, no. He died 30 years ago. His son was living here until he died, and now the grandson wants to be rid of the place. Oh, but why are the villagers still on edge? I think very few of them were around when the old boy was <laughs> handing out his hanging orders. Well, that's true, but in these small villages, Mr. Mason, legend dies hard. They all believe the judge's spirit is still here in the Salford. If that bell were to ring, well... They might think someone was going to die. Precisely. Now, they won't do anything to increase their fears by ringing the bell. He's a rather handsome man, don't you think? Hmm. In a stern sort of way, yes. Yeah, it's a good portrait. Done in his robes. Seated in a high-backed chair. Oh, every inch the judge. And those eyes. They pierce right through you. Uh, there's no phone, I'm afraid. But if you want one... You... Not on your life. There's no one we'd want to call. And we don't want to be disturbed. Oh, then I guess that's that. I have your check for the rent, and if there's anything you need, just pop around to my cottage. Yes, yeah, thanks very much. We'll freshen up and walk into the village tonight for a bite. We passed a nice-looking pub on the way up. Oh, yes, Andy Morn's place. Nothing better between Liverpool and Manchester. <laughs> looking place. It's terrific. Looks exactly like my idea of an English pub. <laughs> and so it should. That's precisely what it is. Uh, welcome, gents. Uh, that table for two, don't you? Thanks. Bit of a chill tonight. Indeed. Brandy for me? Mm, the same. Uh, we you really wanting to eat? Yes, later. Coming through, are you? No, no. We'll be staying here for a while. We've rented the judge's house. You what? My friend and I are working on a paper together. We'll be living in the judge's house. Well, not she is. Oh, you know, the agent told us about... Oh, McKenna. Yeah. What does he know? Judge, you mustn't stay up there. Not on your life. Well, the place suits us just fine. What the... Uh, will McKenna tell you? That you all think the judge's spirit haunts the town. Aye. We don't think. We know. No, we bet we hear brandy in the gif and a bit of advice along with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everyone's looking at us. Always that way when strangers come in. But I guarantee they'll be staring harder when old Andy tells them what we're up to. Makes it more of an adventure. Flaunting superstition right in their faces. Ah, there you are, boys. Two brandies. Now, if I might just sit down, Mary. Uh, listen. I know you don't want to hear this, but... Uh, On the contrary. It makes our position all the more exciting. I wouldn't make light of it, sir. Oh, go ahead. It's true. The old fiend spirits still haunts the hills of self, and 
We've got proof. Yeah? It's been no coincidence that every time there's been a death in Salford for the past two years, since the house was empty, the bell in the tower rang. Rang on the day the person died. Before they died. But who'd ring the bell? The judge, lad. The judge. He's still up there. Mark me. Suppose it was the wind swinging the bell. Oh, come on now. What are you taking me for? There was no wind the first time and any other time. That first day, we all remember it. I'll tell you. One clear morning... The bell starts ringing and ringing. What makes you think it was the judge's ghost? We all ran up to see who was pulling the bell rope. Thought it might be kids on a prank, you know. And you saw the judge? No, 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 no. He peered in the window, and the rope was swinging like mad, and the bell was ringing. But there was nobody in the room. Who else but the ghost of the judge could have been pulling that rope? I tell you, there was no one there. And then someone died? Aye. Oh, Tally. Been sick with pneumonia for two days. Died that night. Where was Mrs. Allen? Next time the bell rang, she tripped over a cat. It had. And uh, that was that. Well, I guess you'd have no reason to lie about it. I suppose this did happen... Four times. Did anyone die without the bell ringing? Not in the past two years. Hmm. Since the judge's son died and left the house empty? Right. Then the bell ringing doesn't really cause the death. Of course not. But how does the old monster know when to ring it? Always when someone is going to die. Have you thought about going up and dismantling the bell? Well, that would put an end to it. <laughs> if you could get a man to go near that place. Well, we'll be living there. We'll have a look. You're still going to stay there? After what I just told you? Of course. I can't believe it. Well, it won't hang on my conscience, whatever happens to you. You don't want to believe me. That's your business. <laughs> think he was pulling our leg about the house? No, he seems serious enough. But it's so far-fetched. Ghosts don't pull bell ropes. I rather think your theory about the wind might have some substance. Perhaps. But there's a wind tonight and not a sound from the bell. Let's have a look at it from inside. Now? Why not? We have a flash. There must be a way up from the upper floor. All right, why not? That small ladder going up to the trap door. That's got to be it. You want to go first? There it goes. The thing's probably rusted shut by now. I hope I can touch it. Any luck? Yes. There it goes. Can you see it? Oh, the bell's enclosed in a housing. Wind couldn't get at it. Not a big one either. Looks like the dinner bell they used to ring at prep school. Want to take off the rope and give the villagers a break? Should I? Well, maybe not. That we better not. Brian, what are you doing? Stop that thing. I didn't touch it. I didn't touch it, Mark. I'm coming down. The damn thing just started clanging. Then someone is down there in the living room, pulling that bell rope. <laughs> Someone or something is pulling the bell rope. Certainly not one of the villagers who hear the judge's house. Certainly not the judge who sits in his high back chair staring out from his portrait. We'll go downstairs with Mark and Brian to learn just what's going on when I return shortly with Act Two. <laughs> Gary? Rain? I was just thinking about you. You're kidding. No, I just read about the blizzard you guys had up there. What blizzard? 1888. 1888, Gary, you son of a gun. Listen, you'll be happy to know it's almost melted by now. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> Look, I'm calling you to invite you to my 50th birthday party. Can you imagine that 50 years? Look, all you have to do is get up here and we'll take care of the rest, okay? Yeah, what is it, Ray? Uh, it's uh, November 11th. November 11th. November 11th, 1983. 1983. That's right, Gary, 1983. See, I don't want anybody saying I didn't give him enough notice. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ray, well, wait a minute. Oh, what's the matter? I think we have plans that night. You're kidding. Of course I'm kidding. Be <laughs> there with bells on. With bells on? With bells on. <laughs> You can hear the sound of savings here at Polk Brothers Warehouse Sale. 8300 West North Avenue next to Maywood Park Racetrack. Thousands of Polk shoppers taking advantage of a major Polk event. Six months of cooperation with hundreds of brand name manufacturers to bring you inflation busting super buys like these. A Carrier 9000 BTU 3 speed air conditioner, $269. A Toastmaster 2 slice toaster, $995. A General Electric 10.5 cubic foot refrigerator, $348. Brand new, brand names with free factory warranties and service. And Polk Brothers still gives you free delivery. A Schweiger full-size sleeper with Herculean cover, $288. A maple rocking chair, take with price $36. The whole family's always welcome at Polk Brothers Warehouse sale, acres of free parking. So remember, the place, Polk Brothers Warehouse in Melrose Park. The time, nightly, including Saturday till 10, Sundays till 6. The event, Polk Brothers Warehouse sale. And you're invited. The bell the old judge used to ring on execution day of victims he had sentenced begins to ring of its own accord, or so it seemed, for Brian, who was inspecting it, never touched it. But two educated young men aren't taken in by myths superstitions or ghosts, there's a practical explanation for everything. Someone's down there pulling on that bell rope. Come on! How did anyone get in? We'll find out. This is as crazy as the story that innkeeper told us. The bell stopped. Look! The rope's still swinging. Well, someone did that, Brian. He's got to be in the house. Where could he go? It only took us moments to come down the stairs. There's no place for anyone to hide. Well, have you got any ideas? No. But the villagers must be having kittens down there. <laughs> you said it. They're wondering who's next. What the devil is that noise? It sounds as though it's coming from up there. Mark, look. There's a hole in the ceiling for the bell rope. I see it, but I don't believe it. A rat. This is my grandmother's tabby cat. Look at the eyes, Brian. The eyes. It's the firelight hitting them. Could the rat have run up the bell rope? Yes. That's what rang the bell. <laughs> Wait till old Andy and the villagers learn their ghostly bell ringer is nothing but a rat. <laughs> well, I hate the thought of sharing a cottage with that. We shan't. We'll get some poison or a trap in the village tomorrow. You'll need a beaver trap to catch that thing. Oh, I keep staring at us. Poison will do the trick. Oh, oh. Well, back away from the hole. <laughs> but it's still up there in the eaves somewhere. Maybe we ought to drive down tonight for the poison. The innkeeper probably has some. We'll do it in the morning. Well, I'm not going to sleep too well with that thing scratching around in the wall. Tomorrow, it'll be dead. That rat just rang its own death knell. Shall we get some work done first? No, let's get into town and get that poison. I'll, I'll work a lot better when we bury that rat. Another drizzly morning. I'll go for the poison. You stay here by the fire. No need for us both to ride down. Well, okay, if you don't mind. I'll put on another pot of coffee. Now bring some fresh eggs from the village. We'll have ourselves a good breakfast and give Mr. Rat his last meal. I watched Brian get into his convertible and swing down the curving road toward the village. I threw another log in the fire. And as I headed for the kitchen to start the coffee, I had a feeling that I was being watched. And I was. I looked up into the eyes of the judge in the portrait. The sensation was incredible. Up 
until now, I'd only given the portrait a passing glance. But now the eye seemed to burn right through me. There was animation in them. They were watching every move I made. I moved closer to the mantel to study the canvas. Here was hate. Revenge and madness rolled into one face. But the eyes. Those incredible eyes. I had to turn away. And when I did, it was only to meet another pair of eyes. A rat was looking down at me from the hole in the ceiling. It sat there, unmoving. As unmoving as a judge in the portrait. Uh, I, I picked up a small log from the hearth. And threw it up at the rat. Oh, I missed. But the rat disappeared into the eaves. And I busied myself in the kitchen until I heard Brian coming in the front door. Hello, Ma? I'm back. In the kitchen. Coffee's ready. I got the rat poison. And a lecture to boot. A lecture? Seems the shopkeeper's as queer about this house as Andy down at the pub. A rat, he says. Fat chance. It's the old judge ringing that bell. Did he say anything about the bell ringing last night? Of course. They're all in an uproar. Brian, I want to tell you something. While you were gone, I, I saw the rat again. It looked down at me from that hole up there. Well, this stuff will soon take care of him. As I looked back at it, I saw... I saw the eyes of the judge. What? The eyes of the judge in the portrait. They looked at me with the same intensity as the eyes of the rat. Well, we'll take the portrait down if it bothers you. And as for the rat, he is about to have his last meal. Oh, and it was being here alone. My imagination worked overtime. We'll spread this poison around and get some work done today. May as well start laying out the structure. Where should we put that stuff? Well, it always seems to appear up by the bell rope. Must have his nest there. We'll put them up there... And some in the pantry, just in case. I sure hope it works. The chap in the village guaranteed it. Get me that stuff out of the kitchen, and I'll sprinkle these pellets in the rafters around the bell rope hole. You better be careful, Brian. Those rats can be vicious. I hope you've got enough of that stuff. We'll soon see. You better take the flash. Yes. Uh, any sign of Brother Rat? Not so far. No. It's not up here now. What is up there? Just a cramped space between the ceiling and the bedroom floor. Yeah, that does it. Hello, what's this? What did you find? A big book of some kind. Like a scrapbook. Well, bring it down. I intend to. Must have been up there for years. I'm surprised the rat hasn't chewed it to bits and made a nest out of it. Well, it's almost falling apart. Look, we'll lay it out on a long table. Belong to the old judge without a doubt. Looks like a lot of newspaper articles. The judge's press clippings? Yes. From papers 40 and 50 years old. Look at this. Hanging judge sentences 200 to die. He was actually proud of it. So it seems. Here's a picture of him. Dated June 19th, 1920. Well, same face as the portrait. Only a lot younger. Hello. Here's an odd one. Look at this. The British Society of Sorcery will hold its monthly meeting at Society Headquarters, 31 Thunder Place, on Thursday, October 1st at 8 p.m. Featured speaker of the evening will be the Honorable Judge Harrison Schelling of Salford, whose topic will be witchcraft and the changing form. The public is invited. Well, now we know his hobby. He gets more fascinating all the time. I might make a hobby of him. What about our monograph? It might tie in nicely. Perfectly. We're doing abnormal psychology. A judge into witchcraft. What a case history. <laughs> I think we've done enough work for one day. You want to go into the village for supper? I just as soon heat up some soup here. It's drizzling and cold out there. Excuse me. It's almost dark, too. 
fire's too good to leave. What was that? What? You didn't hear it? Yeah. Well, something at the floor. There it is. It's one of the poison pellets. He's pushing them down the hole. The devil! Some guarantee that guy in the village gave you. Look at the fiend. He's throwing his stuff back at us. That's one smart rat. <laughs> he knows what's not good for him. Well, look at it this way. He was here before we were. Maybe we're intruding on him. Why don't we just leave him alone? Let him scrounge around as he pleases. It's been his home for we don't know how long. I don't like that idea at all. But at the moment, I, I don't have a better one. Brian and I had a light supper, did some work, let the fire go to embers and went to bed. I don't know how long I'd been asleep when I heard Brian yelling at me and dragging me out of bed. Mark, the house is on fire. Hurry! What? The downstairs is ablaze. Look! I couldn't see flames, but firelight flickered around the stairwell. I grabbed my pants and we hurried downstairs. What? It's the fireplace. I thought the whole house was ablaze. Yes, it's the fireplace, but how come? They were just dying embers when we went up to bed. But how did this start up? I don't know. Fascinating, isn't it? It's downright weird. Someone started that fire up again. Curious, all right. But I'll be darned if I'll attach a supernatural significance to it. Some charcoal just flared up. I didn't say it was supernatural. I said someone started the fire up. Are you accusing me of playing tricks on you? Don't be ridiculous. But you picked a dilly of a house for us to try to concentrate in. <laughs> Brian's upbeat nature kept me from taking things too seriously. But I should have realized we were in a danger far greater than Brian would admit. For the next two days, we worked without incident. And no sign of the rat, thank heaven. We didn't go into the village at all. And we were surprised when we saw Andy, the tavern keeper, approach the house somewhat cautiously. Come in, Andy. How'd uh, you know it was me? Our crystal ball. What? <laughs> we saw you through the window. I <laughs> uh, hope I'm not intruding. No, of course not. Help yourself the sherry. We never thought we'd see you set foot in here. You no, know, I never thought I would either. We well, was getting concerned about you too. Haven't seen you in two days. I was elected to come see you. She was all right. Rather, I lost the draw. And you see, we're fine. Did you get rid of the rat? Well, we don't know. We haven't seen it for two days. Uh, I, I knew those pellets would do the trick. We're not sure it ate any of them. Oh? It kept pushing them down at us from its nest. Up there. You don't believe me? I don't believe anything that might happen in this house. Uh, so that's him. Staring down from the wall. The old hanging judge himself, eh? That's him. Evil as evil can be, he is. You can tell it to look at him. Curious you should put it that way. What way? You said, he is, not he was. Of course he is. You won't believe his spirits here ringing that bell, but we know it. And mark me, you're in for a hard lesson, don't I know it? We appreciate your concern for our well-being. I mean that. Well, if he was about to come to harm, we wouldn't ignore you. Things are... What you tense in the village? About us? About you. About all of us. That blasted bell rang three nights ago. We know. We're waiting. Wondering. Who's going to be next? Do not send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for the judge's next victim. But it's merely a gutter rat that rings the bell when it occasionally runs up and down the bell rope to its nest in the eaves. That's what Brian would have the villagers believe, and perhaps he's right. But that's a big perhaps. 
And we'll find out what really goes on in the judge's house when I return shortly with Act Three. You're working hard, you keep on trying. You want a break, there's no denying. Get the taste that's satisfying. Summerall to remind you that a padlock is only as good as its ability to withstand punishment. That's why True Value Hardware Stores recommend master laminated padlocks. Each is made tough with a laminated construction designed to withstand repeated blows and dual locking levers on the case-hardened steel shackle to resist shimming. When you buy a master lock, you're getting a secure lock. And right now, the master one and a half inch laminated padlock is just four forty four at participating True Value Hardware Stores and home centers. And say that Pat Summerall sent you. Polk Brothers Warehouse Sale, going on now at Polk's Warehouse, 8300 West North Avenue, next door to Maywood Park Racetrack, is the inflation-busting sale of the year. Even folks from Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin drive over and pick up values they could never find at home. Super Polk Savings on America's quality brand names and appliances large and small. Videotape recorders and cameras, TVs, stereos, carpet, furniture. Polk trade-ins for extra savings. Family shopping hours till 10 nightly, including Saturday till 6 on Sunday. A beautiful seven-piece Douglas dinette set is Polk Warehouse sale priced only $139. Make harvest time savings with a Polk priced five cubic foot chest type freezer, $249. A Toro Power Snow Shovel, $69.88. A flip top sofa, $98. Join the happy crowds flocking here to Polk Brothers Warehouse sale on now. But hurry, imagine a Motorola FM stereo and eight track under dash car stereo, only $25. It's at Polk Brothers. This is your Chicago Bears and Chicago White Sox station. Sports Radio 78, WBBM, Chicago. Iron bells in the silence of the night. How we shiver at the melancholy menace of their tone. The people of Salford certainly shiver every time the bell in the judge's house rings. According to them, it means someone is going to die. But it's been several days now since the bell rang last, and the village is still wondering. Who's going to be next? That's your trouble, Andy. You let superstition color your whole life. No one is going to be next. Just because a rat happened to swing on a bell rope. <laughs> you can talk, lad. You have lived in Salford. We know. Well, well, better be getting back. Well, thanks for coming, Andy. We appreciate your concern. Like I said, we hadn't seen you in two days. Just wanted to make sure you was all right. We still think you're lonely. Perhaps. But it will take more than a rat and superstition to get us to leave. Well, I hope for your sake there is nothing more. Good day, now. So long, Andy. We'll be down for a beer. And thanks again for thinking of us. You be careful now. <laughs> Decent chap. They all are, I suppose. Yeah. Want to get back to work? We'd better. <laughs> Thus, then, the psyche is turned inward on itself. There's no other outlet. Something the matter, Mark? Uh, I just can't concentrate. I know I'm acting like one of the villagers, but I can't stand that portrait staring down at us. It really bothers you. Yes, and I'm going to take it down. All right. If you feel better. But he is sort of an inspiration now that we're ready to include him in the paper. Oh, give me a hand, will you? Sure. Heavy, is it? Oh, it's not that. It seems to be nailed to something. It won't budge. So it is. Let's both lift from the bottom. Oh, no use. I'm afraid it's there to stay. Unless we destroy the thing. Oh, no, we can't do that. Well, let's get back to work. I want to go over this scrapbook, item by item. It'll give us a good start on... Hello. Did you move the book? No. 
It's gone. I mean, I distinctly remember leaving it on the corner table here. Oh, well, it's got to be around here. I never touched it. Nor have I. Not since we looked at it the first time. It's absolutely gone. Well, maybe the judge stepped down from the portrait and hid it somewhere. Yeah. To keep us from crying. <laughs> now you're treating the whole situation the way you should. But where could it have gone? <laughs> getting dark. Want to pop down to Andy's for a pint? I'd like nothing better. Hey, hey, more boys? Oh, no thanks. I'm falling asleep from all that ale. I'll finish this and we'll go. Uh, you know, uh, the people have been talking. Oh? Yeah. Sure. Uh, thinking maybe you lads, loony as you are, have maybe given the old thing away. Nothing's happening in the village. You know what I mean? I think we do. We're going to be here for two months. And it's good. This show uh, being there has done something. This is the first time nothing's happened after the bell rang. And we hope it stays that way. we better get back. Let's have the tab, Andy. Well, good night, boys. It's all on me. <laughs> We'd left the light on. Take the flash. I'll pop round back for some firewood. You go in and stir the embers. Okay. I went into the living room. And before I could turn on a light, I knew I was being watched. I flicked on the light and the rat was back. It looked over the rim of the hole. Its eyes aglow with reflected light. Oh, the chill that ran up the back of my neck was indescribable. The rat stared, unmoving, and then it leaped to the bell rope, swinging back and forth, setting off the clanging, twisting and writhing on the rope as it chewed. Chewed right through the rope. It fell to the floor with a thud and turned toward me. I raced to the kitchen and slammed the door. I had to get out of the house. I ran through the kitchen to the back door. Oh, but I couldn't budge it. Mark, what the devil's going on? Why was the bell ringing? I, I can't open the door, Brian. The rat's in the living room. It's crazed. Open the door. I'll push from this side. Now, now. What's happened? Oh, the, the rat loose in the living room. It, it, it's gone mad or something. It, it attacked me. Now, now, calm down. Why did the bell ring? The rat chewed through the bell rope. Oh, Brian, we, we've got to leave here. The rat clawed at the door. Let's take a look. No. Don't, don't open the door to the living room. It's there, waiting. Uh, I don't hear anything. Well, it, it's clever. It's waiting for us to come out. I'm going to see. Can you see him? No. Look, look, look at the bottom of the door. Scratch marks. Yes, you're right. I could almost put up with the supernatural aspects you find so exciting. But we can't stay with a crazed rat. There's no sign of it now. Come on, let's take a look. Supernatural event. Have you lost your mind? We have both seen with our own eyes a figure disappear from a painting. <laughs> we both know it's impossible, but it's happened. There's an incredible supernatural force at work in this house. 
You mean the judge is roaming around the house? The image of the judge. Ah, of course. The lecture in the newspaper advertisement. Witchcraft and the changing form. Mark, this adds up. The spirit of the judge never left the house. It stayed here in the form of the rat. Probably several rats over the years. And the body of the judge is preserved in the portrait. It was there for him to claim whenever he wanted. Dressed in his robes. Remember? The eyes of the rat looked like the eyes of the judge in the painting. What an experience we've stumbled on. You mean you're going to stay here? With that crazy judge on the loose? We can't miss out on this. I want to see what he does next. Do you actually think we're going to meet up with him? He's gone from the portrait. He's got to turn up somewhere. Brian, listen to me. That rat attacked me. That means the judge has murder in mind, too. Look, we have got to get out of here. Mark, there he is. At the top of the stairs. Looming above us. Like some colossus stood the judge. His black robes swirled around him. His long, white hair had a luminous glow. And his eyes. Those eyes. Over his arm hung the bell rope. And in his hand, a black cap. As we stood transfixed, slowly he placed the black cap on his head. The cap British judges always put on when passing a sentence of death. The death cap. Incredible. What a manifestation. He, he's beckoning to us. I'm going up. No. Brian, you can't. It's only an ectoplasmic manifestation of spirit. I want to see what it does. It can't hurt us. Let's just leave. Never. See, it's motioning us to follow. I'm going to follow it. Don't. I'm going to see this through. It's moving away. Down the hall. I must see where it goes. And what it does. Brian, please, don't go up there. Heading for the bell tower. I'm close enough to touch it. Brian. Brian. Answer me, Brian. I raced up the stairs. There was no sign of Brian. I searched every room, every corner of the second floor. Brian and the judge had vanished. I ran back outside, jumped into Brian's car, and headed for help in the village. What is it, Dad? The judge. He's... The judge? He's up at the house. Brian followed him. Up where? There's... But they've both disappeared. Can you get some of the men to come back with me? We have got to find Brian. <laughs> I don't know. There's none but me who dare sit put within that place. Listen. The bell. Why? Oh, it couldn't ring. The rat chewed the rope clear through. Oh, I'm crazy to do it. But I can't leave you alone to face it. Come on. I'll go back up there with you. Roy, Alex, come with us and don't ask questions. And so you saw the judge. He disappeared from the portrait. And then we saw him standing at the top of the stairs. That's when Brian went up to follow him. We better approach cautiously. Peer in the windows first to see what's going on. I'm going in to find Brian. Through the window. I can see it. Brian. Hurry up, man. Quick. Brian. Brian. Yeah, I looked with horror and then covered my eyes. Brian was hanging by the neck from the bell rope. Swinging in slow rhythm to the tolling of the bell. Before I passed out and everything went black, I caught a glimpse of the portrait. The 
judge was back, seated in a high back chair, as though he had never moved. I came to on the lawn with Andy standing over me. Are you all right, Ray? Yes, but Brian. Oh, Brian. He'll be all right, too. We got him down in time. The men have taken him to the pub. He's... He's alive? Indeed. A nasty scar he'll have on his neck, but he'll be all right. The doctor's with him now. Well, what are the men doing over there? Ending this once and for all. We're burning the place to the ground. It'll go up like a tinderbox. Aye. Judge, rat, and all. And if the grandson complains we burned down his house, so be it. We had to protect ourselves from the judge's house. That was the end of it for us. Brian recovered. And we finished our work back at his flat in Liverpool. But I can still remember watching the judge's house collapse into fiery ashes. And the small, furry figure that emerged from the inferno. Its eyes glistening in the light of the flames. Before it scampered off into the woods beyond. toll no more over the judge's house. No longer will the villagers of Salford have to live in fear and dread. We know the rat deserted the sinking ship, or fiery house, to be exact, but without the portrait and the bell and the house, he'll probably end up as just another homeless gutter rat. I'll be back shortly. Hi, I'm Julia Motto for White Westinghouse. Because food storage needs are so different, White Westinghouse makes refrigerators in many styles and sizes. You can get spacious side-by-sides in both three-door or two-door styles. Or choose a model with the freezer on the top, even a model with the freezer on the bottom. And if you already have a separate freezer, buy the all-refrigerator model. Many good reasons to White Westinghouse, your house. White Westinghouse, your house. Pause for a moment and listen to your shoes. They may need to be cat's pawed. Hey, stop! What do you think you're doing? We just need heels and soles. How could you throw us out in the street? Well, we've been so good to you and your feet. New shoe prices out of sight. Look for the sign of a cat and make your tried and true shoes as good as new shoes. With cat's paw, heels and soles. Take us to the shop. Come on and get a cat an exciting money-saving warehouse sale is going on right now here at Polk Brothers Warehouse Store in Melrose Park on North Avenue next to Maywood Park Racetrack. From our furniture department, a Herculean covered sofa, $500 value, only $299. From Polk's Portable Appliance Department, an insecticide bug light, $28.88. From TV, a Magnavox six-hour VHS video tape recorder, only $638. From Polk's Major Appliance Department, a Magic Chef Family Size Microwave Oven 239. The magnificent list goes on and on. Every department slashing prices on top quality brand names to bring Polk customers shopping our warehouse sale extra value. Enjoy new carpet for the holidays. Alexander Smith Plush and Loop, 999 a square yard installed over sponge rubber pad. Remember, you still get Polk's huge trade-in allowances. Use Visa, MasterCard, or Polk's revolving charge. And enjoy shopping time nightly, including Saturday till 10, Sundays until 6. Believers in witchcraft staunchly maintain that certain evil spirits, the devil most notably, can survive for years, sometimes centuries, by taking on various other life forms. One way of living forever, I suppose. But I don't think I'd like it. I mean, what's the good of living forever if your friends can never recognize you? Our cast included Gordon Gould, Lloyd Batista, and Robert Dryden. 
The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. That's right. If you're going to stay up with us tonight, uh, we welcome you to an all.